Hi, if you're interested in buying an electric car or if you own an EV, whether it's from Hyundai or Tesla or Nissan or any of the other kind of automakers, you should be interested in battery health. So the health of the main traction battery, the main high voltage DC battery that's in the car, in the car you want to buy or in the car you own. It's one of the more expensive components of the car. And as I've explained in previous videos, it's not that easy to find out from the manufacturers or in the car, or if you're buying one secondhand through some kind of diagnostics that are easy to access and not kind of idiosyncratic to a particular car model through apps or whatever, it's difficult to find out the battery health. Now, it's a mixture of kind of not wanting to bamboozle customers, potential customers, I think here, and also a lack of standards, as I've talked about in my previous video on battery health of the Ionic Electric, particularly. There aren't that many international standards. There's no real international standards around about state of health, you know, the overall kind of health uh, indication of longevity of a battery, how it's degrading or degenerating over time. No real standards as to how to measure that, how to represent that, how to convey that to customers and users. Out of the blue, with an operating system update to my phone, I think it was iOS 13, Apple has actually come to the fore here and added some things around battery health. Now, again, it's not exactly on the surface, and Apple have had kind of well-publicized debacles about, you know, throttling the performance of their phones and not having replaceable batteries and reducing performance and, you know, obviously trying to get people to upgrade on all sorts of accusations against Apple, some of which are probably well-founded, others I'm not in a position to comment. But one thing that Apple has done that's quite interesting with these latest updates is provide some very clear descriptions of what's going on in the battery. So firstly, it's clear that, you know, the battery of choice in all these kind of things in, in the watch on my wrist, in the phone I'm filming on, in my laptop that I'm looking at to provide these uh, bits of information, in electric cars that I've driven in the past, Nissan Leaf, Hyundai Ionic, I've test driven other cars, all of these things have lithium ion batteries. And we know that lithium ion batteries are, you know, really kind of in vogue, they're in lots of devices now, and also the Nobel Prize for Chemistry this year, 2019, was for lithium ion batteries. Um, as you can see here, you know, that just creating a rechargeable world rather than all these disposable batteries that used to exist, now at least there's the option to recharge and kind of like reuse the materials over and over again. So it's a big thing. Apple has provided quite an interesting overview of, you know, why lithium ion batteries in the first place. So it says they're inside all these different devices that Apple make. So then it says, you know, the rechargeable lithium ion in particular is there because it provides the best performance. You know, this is true in electric cars as well. And compared with other types of battery that people have developed over time, they weigh less, last longer, and charge more efficiently. So that gives you an indication of, you know, why that particular type of technology in the first place. Then in the phone, and of course it's, a, it's an iPhone here, an Apple phone, they give these breakdowns of maximum capacity, peak performance capability, and the option to have optimized battery charging. Again, you know, these are not ideal terms for anything, but at least they're trying, and at least they're trying clear language, and you don't find this kind of clear descriptions with short text, either in the menus, in your infotainment system, in an electric car, typically, or even in the user manual, or when you buy an EV from a dealer, they don't give you this kind of straightforward information. And if you remember in my previous video on battery health, I was looking for some kind of way and ideas about how you might represent these particular things. So let's start then with their openness about the overall thing. So they say phone batteries, like all rechargeable batteries, you can read EV batteries here as well, are consumable components that become less effective as they age. Then they go through maximum capacity. So this is the thing that Apple's got into problems about before, is that, you know, it was throttling phones when the maximum capacity had dropped below a certain level. So maximum capacity, they say, is the measure of battery capacity relative to when it was new. So again, not exactly a precise definition of state of health of a battery, but at least they're trying in plain English. Lower capacity may result in fewer hours of usage between charges. So you could say that lower capacity may result in lower range between charges, if you're kind of translating it into an EV situation. Then there's this thing about peak performance capability. It says your battery, in my case, is currently supporting that. This is not bad given for this phone is about two years old and I've been using it all the time, so it's not bad, I guess. There with a the car, you'd think about that's, you know, gives you the maximum power, I guess, uh, output of the car. And then this new feature they've added is this optimized battery charging. I've got it on because it's on by default. It says to reduce battery aging, iPhone learns from your daily charging routine, and I've read somewhere else it does this through machine learning, 
so it can wait to finish charging past 80% until you need to use it. So in the first electric car I had a Nissan Leaf, it had a sort of long battery life option, an 80% thing that you could stop charging then. But of course the car didn't kind of use machine learning or anything to work out when I wanted 100% from my daily and weekly and monthly usage patterns, whereas my phone presumably is trying to do that. Um, I don't know how regular my routines are, but at least it, it's trying and it'll sort of stop charging at a percentage that will protect the battery from you know uh, accelerated degradation by holding it at full state of charge for too long which we know from research about lithium-ion batteries will degrade the state of health over time so this is doing it automatically now i think in teslas there's more advanced battery management systems to do this kind of thing and i think even scheduled charging um, that's been on tesla for some time tries to do this there's optimized battery charging so now if we look at what this kind of uh, apple gives you as tips about maximizing what they call battery life and lifespan so battery life they define as the amount of time your device runs before it needs to be charged so that would be range and usage usable range in an ev then they say battery lifespan is the amount of time your battery lasts until it needs to be replaced maximize both you'll get the most out of it so they're showing tips for their kind of ios devices for apple watch for macbook and so on um, so firstly they say have the latest software um, and then they go to these temperature characteristics of lithium-ion batteries so firstly avoid extreme ambient temperatures so here what's interesting is that they say you know even sort of like storing a battery in a hot environment can damage it we've seen that with nissan leafs in places like arizona and so on in the states charging a device when there's high ambient temperatures damages it even further um, and the software, again, might limit charging above 80% when this is warm with a phone. Um, so Nissan could learn a lot from this kind of clarity. Um, it says then about cold environment and your battery life may be reduced, uh, but it will, that's a temporary condition. But I like the fact that they've given here, you know, the kind of the sweet spot, the, the comfort zone of uh, the sort of portable devices and the, of the laptops as well. Um, and it's slightly different, which is interesting. I don't know if that's to do with the characteristics of the device or the particular battery they've got in it. Then they give tips for, you know, leaving it half charged when you store it long term. You can find these things in like the Hyundai Ionic Electric manual if you really look for it. Um, but they give you various tips here about, you know, keeping it in an environment that's not too hot, um, charging it every six months up to 50% and that it might take longer when it's been cold to sort of start charging. So I don't find this, this useful on a phone, but it might be useful to have these kind of like detailed data on a car about the battery health. They give you all these various things. And yeah, so this kind of thing is, is useful, I think. It's, it's, Apple is showing, admittedly, after controversy, and you've still got to look for this information. It's not on the kind of front screen of your phone, typically. They are giving some indicators here, some pointers, I think, about how to communicate about this important issue of battery health to preserve the lifespan of the most expensive part, most expensive single component of your electric car for longer. And possibly some thoughts about, you know, things you can ask an owner about uh, in terms of, you know, the, the heat and other things, and maybe there could be data on these kind of things. If you're looking for a second-hand one to get some more indication about the state of health of that particular car. Now, I'm not saying Apple is perfect, but I do think it would be, well, there's kind of a debate here, I think, between providing too much information. Maybe manufacturers think it'll bamboozle people. Uh, maybe they're also trying to kind of provide minimal information to protect against warranty claims, um, not to get kind of scandals or negative publicity about, you know, the longevity of the batteries in cars or the cost or price of them. So it's kind of a spectrum between provide nothing and avoid a panic or provide too much and bamboozle people and maybe put people off because they think it's too complicated to own an electric car. Again, as I said in my previous video about the kind of battery health issue, I think, you know, better to try and be somewhere in the middle and be fairly transparent about it just up front and educate dealers to be able to tell customers about this, but also provide the data if people want to dig in, have it all there, have the clear definitions there, have the data there, and just provide as much as possible. But I think Apple is doing a good thing here in that they're trying to make the language clearer. In the previous video where I looked at the standards and so on, it's a nightmare. So you need someone to come in and try and provide, you know, simple definitions of the concepts, plain English. This might not be perfect, but I think, you know, even Tesla, who's pretty good at this kind of thing, battery management software, having options indicating when batteries are cold, providing, you know, optimized battery heating to get to superchargers and charge at the correct sort of, you know, optimum temperatures, all these kind of things. Even they could learn to communicate this better. And certainly the other manufacturers, Hyundai, Nissan, the others I've experienced, could do an awful lot better. Um, again, I think a lot of it is conservatism and kind of like, you know, cost avoidance around warranties and things like that, uh, with customers wanting new batteries if they think it's gone below a certain condition. But, you know, this issue is not going to go away for electric cars. They're very dependent on this particular technology. This technology, for now at least, has these characteristics. There's constantly all kinds of developments underway to try and reduce these aging issues 
through all sorts of different things and different you know chemical compositions and things but for now this is what there is and i think the clearer the better in terms of communicating about battery health so that's my topic for this week a bit of an update about what i'm doing after a long time of wandering around on buses and on foot um, i finally got some e-bikes and actually ended up with two in one week so i now have a cargo family e-bike and a kind of the buzz roar the big fat tire e-bike um, for my wife and i to share i haven't had time to do decent videos about it i've been taking the family out on rides and we've been trying them out I'll do some proper reviews for a later video or later videos. I'm having a lot of fun with that. I'm very excited by the prospect of going even lower emissions than the zero tailpipe emissions nature of an electric car. For now, I'm gonna try it for the winter and you know, come back to it. Still wanna get test drives. I'm really time poor at the moment recording this, You know, still with packed boxes that need to be taken to a charity shop. Other things, I used the cargo bike actually to take some uh, waste to the recycling area. So it's already proved, proved useful. But yeah, bit time poor, bit rushed this week, but hoping to get back to reviews of the new e-bikes and some test drives of some of the new EVs. So please subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos coming from me. And uh, thanks for watching and bye for now. Mm -hmm.